the course has been run, the, the first course, which was based on our spatial, uh, was organized by political scientists in Trondheim in the summer of 2004. That was very early. Uh, and subsequently, I've done other doctoral courses or tutorials. Uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, 15 years ago is Trondheim, summer of, of 2004 for political scientists. Uh, organized in collaboration with the Peace Research Institute Oslo uh, and conflict studies, and studies of conflict. Uh, this was at the time when we had no idea that anybody used the software we were writing. Uh, so what I'll be doing initially for the first half hour or so, I'll go through a schedule in a moment, is to talk about the background for, for where we are, where these, these two books came from. This is the first edition of our book from 2008, which is quite like the original course. Then the second edition of the book from 2013. And when we get about uh, half an hour into this morning, I'll be explaining why we haven't got a third edition of the book, which is that the world has changed and we are under contract for a different book, uh, Virgilio, who's the co-author in, in this one, has several books which have just been published on, on Bayesian statistics. Uh, and Edsa Pepsmer and I are under contract for a different book, but it's not ready yet, and we're not quite sure where we are. So that you're in a, in a, uh, a slightly difficult place, uh, because uh, those who've taken responsibility for making things happen over the last 15 years are somewhat uncertain about where we are and where we should be going. But that will develop as it goes. That's with regard to data representation and data handling. With regard to, uh, with regard to analysis, uh, then I'll be talking to you once we're off streaming uh, later on about uh, choice of topics towards the end of the week. At the moment, the end of the week is a bit uh, uncertain and, and I need feedback from you about that. Uh, the format for all of the talks is, is identical, so that you get a copyright notice, CC by, uh, CC by SA. Uh, I'm running uh, current R, uh, 361, on Fedora 31, so on, 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 on Linux. Uh, these are the packages which you need to have installed if you want to run the code which is for this morning, and the code can be downloaded from this link on, on GitHub. So this is a zip file which contains the R script. In some cases, there's just the R script. In some cases, there's the R script and some data files. Uh, the schedule for the whole, uh, the whole course is uh, today looking at spatial data representation, which is something which uh, you may find um, unnecessary. Please just let us get to work. Sorry, we've got to look at data representation. Um, it saves time in the longer run. You may know your data at the moment, but in two years' time, you'll be on a different project. The data will be different. Data representation matters, and in particular, the changes which are occurring in data representation. We'll go through to 11 o'clock. We turn off the streaming. Then we can talk a bit for, say, half an hour if I haven't keeled over. Then we take lunch break. Uh, then we can interact a little bit more before one o'clock, then start again with streaming at 1.15, and uh, then look at support, topology, input, output. So those are other elements. Tomorrow morning, looking at coordinate reference systems, and then in the afternoon, visualization. And the visualization, I'd like you to be fairly active and try things out. There's a lot which has been changing, certainly since, since the, the books were written, and much of it is, is, is quite exciting. Uh, on Wednesday morning, and this is then up to discussion, if nobody needs uh, interfaces with uh, GIS, then we can choose something else. Uh, and from then on, it will be analysis, depending on what your needs for analysis are, then we can, we can uh, uh, substitute topics from, from, from then on. And I've said project surgery on Wednesday after lunch. That means that... that uh, I won't be talking to you, but you can you can uh, talk to me about your project. So we'll be, 
be here in, in, in the classroom and we can, we can do that. And the same thing on Friday after lunch with a presentation towards the, the end of the, the afternoon. Then on Saturday, uh, presentations, for those of you who haven't presented on Friday. And then we'll be done. Uh, I, I, I was a little bit worried about my first line in, in, the, in, in the outline. Why break stuff and then why not? Uh, there are some people who provide open source software who really enjoy breaking stuff. I don't. But sometimes you have to. <laughs> so what I'll be doing in data representation uh, in input-output in visualization, particularly in coordinate reference systems, is talking about things which have now outlived their uh, usefulness, but still have many users, which means uh, how do we manage a process of migration to more modern, robust, and sustainable uh, representations of the data. It's also useful to know that uh, there's good communication between, uh, between the various communities, and this includes the Python communities. The Python community is, is uh, also lively, does things, and uh, I can provide links if someone's interested to a, a, an R Python workshop that I did in, in September in Luxembourg. There are new opportunities for visualization, particularly the team up package and map view. Uh, and these are then, there are challenges regarding the upstream uh, software libraries, and I'll be talking about, about these. Um, and I'll go on to talk something about spatial, spatial weights, spatial autocorrelation, spatial regression, if that's something that you find, find useful. And I can talk, talk about that because I'm responsible for those packages. Uh, that's SPDEP and, and spatial reg. And then we, we can choose other things to do later on as well. So this morning, and we're now uh, at uh, 9.15 to 9.45. Check Slido. And I have a confirmation from outside that streaming is, is running. So. As I, at least I can relax that the stream, stream, streaming is, 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 is running. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo. <laughs> uh, we haven't really worked out a way to get feedback, but Slido was one of the, the possibilities that it may be that some questions come in through Slido as well. But, but for the time being, this will be more or less sort of straight um, um, provision inf information from my side. Um, if any concepts that I'm using are uh, unknown to you, please put up your hand, say. Uh, not only uh, may I, at the moment I'm stuck completely inside a particular problem of data representation and I find it quite difficult to get out of it, so that it may be that what I, uh, what I say to you, even though I'm speaking English, does not make any sense. Uh, if that is the case, put your hands up and say, Ooh, could you repeat that in English, please? Uh, in which case, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, and um, the fact that I'm, I'm at one battery bar rather than five battery bars uh, means that I may actually get lost in my own thoughts. If I do, wake me up. Now... If we step back, not 15 years, not uh, even 20 years, but if we step back 25 years, uh, many of us were teaching courses in spatial analysis, or many of the small group of people were teaching courses in spatial analysis. Ed Sir Pepsma's work was in particular in, in geostatistics and writing an excellent standalone, uh, standalone program, GSTAT, uh, for, uh, for uh, geostatistical analysis. Uh, others were working in the same field, the same area. Uh, Albrecht Gepard was, was, was uh, teaching in, in Klagenfurt, and other people were teaching, were trying to find software tools to teach the, uh, uh, 
sort of outside GIS. It's not that GIS was a bad thing, but that most, most geographical information systems did not really provide the tools that you needed to do analysis. And partly this could be, uh, could be uh, concerned with, uh, with uh, ge um, geostatistical analysis, GSTAT. Partly it could be concerned with, with point patterns originally in, in, um, in spatial point pattern analysis, the, the S plus package Splanks a spatial Lancashire because it was at the University of Lancaster, Lancaster University, and so on. There were people who needed software to, to, to do analysis, to do, uh, to do teaching. And it was also an advantage if the license fees for the teaching software were not uh, unreasonable. As most universities had limited budgets for software, and going to the going through the departmental and faculty committees to try to get more money to buy more software was difficult. GSTAT was open source from from the beginning. Splanks was made available to license holders of S plus free, so that there was a community working working. There were there were disparate individuals working who maybe knew each other. Uh, it was possible to write and share scripts for, for Arc Info in AML, uh, Arc View, or Visual Basic for ArcGIS, site licenses, dongles. And I, I still have a postcard from a French uh, ecologist uh, by my screen saying, and this is from a long time ago, this is from 15 years ago, 14 years ago, saying, uh, I'm sitting here on an island in a river in Tibet with my students. Uh, our batteries are still running. We can do the analysis on site because we have open source software. So otherwise you had to have a dongle which you attached to the parallel port of your laptop. So that working in the field was clunky if you had to have licenses, if you didn't have to have licenses. In 2005 in an island in Tibet, you didn't have internet connection. In any case, you couldn't run Arc Info um, uh, with a license fed from a license manager on the internet. So there was a practical problem in teaching and field work, which could be resolved by open source software. So site licenses, dongles, nowadays they seem completely, I mean, why would anybody need anything like that? Everything's open source, but then it wasn't. Uh, from late 96, R became a, a viable alternative for teaching. And a couple of us, several of us started saying, okay, well, why don't we try this out? R uses much of the, or began by using much of the syntax of the S language, which was then commercially available. And quite a lot of universities did have site licenses, and they were managed in a different way to the GIS licenses. R is uh, licensed under the GNU General Public License, um, uh, version 2, and remains so, so that it, it's free to use uh, wherever the user wishes to, free to use, extend, distribute, and so on, um, with modifications to the code restricted by the, by the GPL, so that you can't sell a modified version without contributing back uh, the modifications that you've made. This is slightly different from the Python ethos, but it's the ethos that, uh, that, that R has. Uh, in 1997, 1998, maybe uh, at the end of 1996, a spatial stats module was made available for, uh, for um, S+. Plus, but it was still licensed. You still needed an S+, plus license, and you needed a license for, the, for that, uh, for that um, uh, module. And there was uh, also a meeting in Leicester in, in the UK where quite a number of people working on exploratory spatial data analysis met and, and uh, discussed all kinds of things. How, how could we use uh, even uh, tickle, t t t uh, tickle TCL was a, a, a language, a scripting language at the time. I, I was using ORC as a scripting language in addition to C. Um, Porting of S code to R was begun by Albrecht uh, Gephardt because he needed it for teaching and uh, was then made available as soon as the R package mechanism matured, which is, is 20 years ago. Uh, so that porting mattered because if you'd, if you'd been running a course using S plus and the different uh, 
in S plus they're called libraries, uh, which were available, S Geostat, uh, Splanks, and so on. So these were available and you could teach with them. So, okay, so you can imagine that you're dealing with uh, master's courses or what we would now call master's courses uh, or doctoral courses, give, giving uh, introductions in applied uh, uh, spatial data analysis. There is a separate book by Bailey and Gattrell on uh, interactive spatial data analysis from the mid-1990s, distributed with a diskette, which you had to run on Windows. Uh, but Windows, no, you had to run it on DOS. It wouldn't run on Windows because the mouse didn't work, because they had a special mouse driver. So that, that everybody who was teaching this kind of stuff was trying to, how on earth can we get it to, 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 to work? distribute it to our students without them having to go around with these, these half kilo dongles. Um, it wasn't half kilo, it was maybe 100 grams, but, but still. Uh, so that the, 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 the first packages that are on the comprehensive R archive network from, from um, uh, 1998 were uh, ported by, by Albrecht Gephardt, were uh, Tripac, Akima, both available within S plus and unfortunately on, on non-open source licenses, but needed by people who were doing uh, spatial work, uh, followed by ASH, SGeostat, uh, 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 six months later, so ab about a semester later, so that you could see the, 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 the clock of the semesters ticking so that Albrecht was getting stuff out which matched the, the, uh, the, um, the semesters. Uh, Albrecht also helped uh, port parts of the uh, spatial package, which is part of the modern applied uh, statistics with S. Uh, from the various, uh, from the very beginning, the the uh, CRAN administrators were very helpful. Uh, Albrecht and I were in contact, and we did a, a, a um, seriously mismanaged talk at the uh, um, uh, regional science conference in Vienna in 1998. We had a 20-minute slot and we used 45. But, but people were tolerant in those times. You didn't have these people with their, we'll turn off your Beamer stuff. Because the, actually they were interested, they were sympathetic and, and they gave us some feedback. Um, so then we were able to show that uh, in some cases, in, in, in packages which you had to download from our own FTP sites, you could do the teaching you needed to do, and if you needed to do research in the field, you could, you could do, do, this, do this as well. Uh, the S plus version, uh, I've already mentioned, of, of Splunks, and I'd contacted Barry Rowlingson in 1997, uh, but only moved forward because of the, the, the amount of Fortran involved in, in, the, in porting the package to uh, September 1998. And at that stage, we'd started realizing that there was an issue because we had an implementation of Ripley's K test for uh, spatial randomness. Let's call it that, it's not quite that, but, but uh, for point patterns in the spatial package. And we had another one in the Splunk's package. And it would be really nice to be able to confirm that both of them gave the same results from the same data. So, okay, so we've got a standard test. Now, are the two implementations the same or different? So this was a question which arose very early. Um, and so this is this, this quote from an email. Uh, an issue I thought about a little is whether at some stage Albrecht and I wouldn't integrate or harmonize the points and pairs objects in Splunk's spatial and SGeostat. They aren't the same, but for users, maybe they ought to appear to be so. So we were thinking about shared classes for representing uh, spatial data. And it turned out that this was quite fruitful. I stepped aside a little and worked with Marcus Nettler on uh, an interface to the GRASS GIS. Uh, Grass GIS is, uh, was originally public domain and became open source in, in the mid-1990s. It was written by the US Army, and it was written for the reasonably unmilitary purpose of monitoring erosion on army ranges. So that if you drove your tanks along the contours of a, of a hill, then they created fewer gullies than if you drove them down the hill. 
so that this this was so that they were interested in modeling the erosion caused by army exercises on an army range in the middle of the states and so so grass existed and still exists it's now at uh, the uh, 782 is now considered almost ready to be released the uh, release candidate was published last night so that I was working on interfacing R and grass and, and using, using R to analyze quite large uh, raster data sets from, from, from grass at, at that point in time. It was class, classi classifying uh, landscape types. Uh, the, um, the interface has, both to grass has evolved and interfaces to other uh, GIS have also, uh, also evolved. And if you want me to talk more about this, then we can, we can look at that on, on, on Wednesday morning. Uh, I'll already draw your attention to this book. Uh, if you need a uh, help, I don't know what to do, I'm new to this, then this is the book to go to. Uh, it's not the third edition of our book, although Robin Lovelace wrote a very well thought through review of the second edition of the book. He knew the book before, uh, but he was thinking, how do you teach people towards the end of the 2010s this stuff? And he's saying, this isn't going to work. The, the, the reviews of the first edition were, okay, this is tough stuff, but if I have a doctoral student who has to do it, then I give him this and tell him to chew until he's chewed all the way through. So in the 20s, so 20 zeros, then people were expected to have uh, considerable um, determination and independence of thought. And if they didn't understand a paragraph, they were expected to reread it and read it successively until they had understood it. Uh, in the 2010s, this is not so much the case and people are more perhaps expected to be um, stroked. So I'm not saying that this book isn't uh, accurate, concise, but it is more reader friendly. Uh, so, and it's also available online. In addition to the printed e edition, it was it was written as a as as a, a book down project, and the link is is provided in in the references at the end of the slides. So, if you're lost at the moment, this book will be your friend. One of the so. Going back to 20 years ago, uh, working on different, different uh, packages on the archive network, the archive network team, who were the uh, Kurt Honig, uh, Fritz Leisch in Vienna, said that we're going to have a meeting for our people in, in March 2001. And can you come and give us a talk about the grass interface? OK. So it's a bit scary. I'd done another scary thing in. Uh, 1986, when I went to the European Unix user group meeting to talk about spatial data, as I'd sent an abstract and said, they're not going to be interested in this, but they put me in a plenary session with three, 400 people, including uh, the Next developers. Next was what came before the new Mac. So it was where Steve Jobs went when he wasn't friends with Apple. Uh, and the, they were seriously intense people. So I talked to some of them after my talk. And they, they, they were actually quite uh, interested about what was going on and what people were doing with spatial data and why Unix was useful for this and, and the, the modular approach to writing, writing software. That was, that was scary. But then walking into this room with people about whom I... The only thing I knew was that they... First, they were... They were all statisticians, I'm a geographer, and they'd all written a, a good deal of software which I used on a daily basis. And uh, they were very kind, polite, uh, interested even, and, and so on. So, so, so that, 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 was, that was fun. And they were extremely uh, helpful to talk to because you've got all kinds of, sort of hints. Well, had you thought of doing it that way? Did you try that out? And so on. So the, the community was, was feeding back and the mailing list as well was, was very useful. So that I, I knew all of them from the mailing list. We were 
uh, fewer than 70 uh, at, the, at this, this meeting in, 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 in Vienna. So unique insights, yes, definitely. Uh, a bit later the same year, I was asked to go to, to Santa Barbara to a workshop on software for uh, spatial data by Luke Anselin and Serge Ray. Serge Ray is most involved in Python development, and Luke Anselin has been more involved in coordinating uh, standalone uh, programs at the time, uh, uh, SpaceStat, which uh, unfortunately escaped his, his control, uh, and uh, subsequently Geoda. Uh, and I was continuing to work on uh, 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 spatial econometrics as a, as a, as a, as a narrower field. Uh, during the, the, the second half of, uh, of 2002, it seemed sensible to try and do something at the next R meeting in Vienna. So the next R meeting was being organized, and I'd been asked, could, could you do a, a paper session on spatial statistics? So, it, well, okay, we, we can send out some emails, get some people to submit papers, and we'll see how that goes. And I also thought of that maybe we should have a workshop to, to discuss classes for spatial data. Uh, I'd contacted uh, Ed, uh, Edsa Pepsma because of his work with GSTAT, and he'd, at the time, coincidentally, this is the end of 2002, been approached uh, by a, a, a Netherlands environmental agency to write an interface between GSTAT and S+. And so from an email from EDSA in November 2002, so that we're now 17 years ago, uh, he, he, he mentioned, perhaps I should, I wonder whether I should start writing S classes. I'm afraid I should. Uh, I'm not sure whether he, hello? <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> whether he's grateful uh, for the insight, but since then, he, he has done lots of other things, but, but uh, certainly engagement with, with classes has been, uh, has been, uh, has been um, very fruitful. Uh, Virgilio Gomez-Rubio, th my third co-author in the book, had developed two packages. One's R Arc Info for in interfacing old uh, Arc Info uh, uh, vector formats and D Cluster for disease clustering and was also committed to coming to that meeting. And then other people wanted to come to the meeting or did come to the meeting, like Marcus Nettler, Albrecht Gephardt, uh, Manfred Fischer, and a number of other people. So we were about a dozen. Uh, Nicholas Lewin Koch, who'd made contrib contributions to map tools, also said more or less the same kinds of things. Uh, there's a lot of duplication effort. I did notice after looking through people's packages that there's a lot of duplication effort. My suggestion would be to set up a repository for spatial packages, which we did on SourceForge, similar to Bioconductor mode with the base spatial packages, which has S4, that was then new style uh, S classes and methods, which are efficient in general. So that we had, a, if you like, a mandate before we met or, or around the time that we met to do this. After the workshop, we set up a collective repository on SourceForge, set up the RSIG Geo mailing list, and there are still 3,500 subscribers. And that was the beginning of the SP package. So we had a mandate for the development of the SP package. Discussions we then met for coding meetings in Lancaster with Barry Rowlingston in 2004, uh, with Virgilio in Valencia in 2005, and we got uh, SP onto uh, the uh, comprehensive R archive network in April 2005. So what we'd done when we went for, 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 for writing the SP package, it's a package containing uh, definitions of classes for spatial data uh, was to use new style class representations for spatial objects, whether they were rest or a vector, and that they should behave like data frame objects. And then we also, in the, the, the SP package, contained visualization methods to make it easy to show, show, show those objects. So check to see whether there are any further comments. No, good. So, One of the things that we were clear about was that we shouldn't uh, oblige the authors of any other package to 
use those classes. If they wanted to use them, they could. If they didn't, we would provide coercion methods. That's a way of converting a spatial, say, a spatial points object into uh, a PPP object for point pattern analysis. That we that you could move freely between the representations. If a package didn't want to adopt the SP uh, representation of data, fine, great, not a problem. Uh, we did talk about it whether we should whether we should do this, and very early on we said we're not sure that our representation is the one which sort of one size fits all. So we won't we won't go out and assert in that way. Uh, the SPATSTAT package has grown considerably, it does very well, and we keep the interface with SPATSTAT uh, up to date and and completely current and running from from SP. We have this year made a radical change, which is that up until uh, the penultimate release of map tools, you could convert point, a point pattern in geographical coordinates that's in a degree, decimal degree metric into a PPP object for point pattern analysis, despite the fact that the SPATSTAT package was designed to handle planar ge geometries so that distance measurements should be Euclidean and not great circle. Uh, and uh, Edsa took this up in a question to uh, Adam Bad uh, Adrian Baddeley's uh, uh, plenary at a spatial statistics conference in Spain in July this year to say, why can people still make the mistake? He said, I have this problem. I have students who have data in geographical coordinates and they coerce them to SPATSTAT and carry on happily <laughs> analyzing their points even though the technically the results are rubbish. So we agreed that we would, uh, we would insert either warnings or errors into the coercion so that if it was known that your object was, uh, was in geographical coordinates, then you, you get a slap in the face and, and don't do that. There is a way around, of course, which is to say that we don't know what, whether the, 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 the data are in geographical or planar coordinates, in which case planar are assumed. That's the user's choice. So that now if the user goes in with data which are known to be in geographical coordinates, they get a pushback. But that's, that's the, first, the first radical intervention that we've made uh, in, in, in 15 years. So there's quite a lot of continuity here, and continuity is something that we see as, as mattering. Uh, accessing data from outside had been available in the map tools package uh, prior to uh, prior to, to, to um, uh, other work uh, for shapefiles. Uh, this was superseded by our Google. But our Google had originally been written simply to read raster. Uh, I'm using some uh, pronunciations which you're not familiar with. I call it um, CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network because there's also CPAN, which is the Comprehensive Perl Archive Network, and CTAN, the Comprehensive Tech Archive Network. And some of the software originally used for CRAN was also used for CPAN. Um, it was written in Perl, too. So that, that CRAN was written in Perl until quite, quite late and ran in Perl. So that's a, a, a possibly a, an unusual pronunciation. The other unusual pronunciation which I've just used is our Google. And why am I calling something which you might write as, as, as um, uh, uh, GDAL? You might read that as GDAL, and I'm reading it as Why am I doing that? Well, because the, the, one of the, uh, the prime original contributors to the software library, uh, Frank Warmerdam, said that they always wanted it to be object-oriented, so that he, he, he always pronounced it uh, uh, geographical object-oriented data abstraction library 
but they never really got it very object-oriented, but he kept pronouncing it that way because that was their original ambition. So when you hear me say Goodall, I mean what maybe you might have pronounced as Gidal, but Goodall. Goodall provided uh, extensive access to, to raster data, and the original work there was done by, by, uh, by um, uh, Tim Kate. Other parts of uh, Goodall for reading vector data, which is what was then called the OGR part of Goodall, were written separately by Barry Rowlingson. And Barry also contributed parts for dealing with uh, coordinate reference system uh, projections or transformations. Uh, this was then made SP um, or it was adapted to SP so that both our Google looking at uh, raster data provided uh, Ray could read in a spatial object, could write from a spatial object out to a raster, could read into a spatial object from a vector file, could write out from a spatial object to a vector file. So all of these things were, were, in place, uh, were in place fairly early on, but in bits, and it took a little longer. Uh, this was, so that, that was complete by about 2000, 2008. So completing this involved uh, uh, using the external libraries Google and Proj, uh, and then We've managed to keep the, the everything running more or less, more or less, uh, more or less consistently since then. This was then using the SP package to define the classes and the Argoodle package to handle data input and output into either raster or vector representations. Uh, the final part of the framework arrived with uh, thanks to Colin Rundle, who participated in a 2010 Google Summer of Coding project and uh, led to the RGOS package, which permitted us to do spatial vector data handling so that we could do topological operations on vector. However, at this stage, the warning bells were ringing uh, because the internal representation of the uh, vector geometries used by uh, by Google and Geos uh, were what was what are known as simple features representations. This is an international standard which became, began to become uh, become important during the end of the 2000 zeros. So that by 2000, so by about the time we we were th done with writing the first book, the uh, the. Uh, the choices we'd made in terms of uh, vector representation and to a certain extent also raster representation were beginning to show. So we'd made choices seven, eight years earlier. They were documented in the first edition of the book and they were already beginning to show uh, uh, that, that the choices we made were not the only ones which were possible. So we published the first edition. Uh, so it was completed in <coughs> 2007 published in 2008. Uh, some of it was modified immediately prior to, to publication. And the second edition of the book uh, was th then involved a certain amount of, of uh, modification, as about 20, 30% of the book was changed between the first and second edition, came out in, in 2013. Uh, the significant changes were the addition of the space-time package and the ad addition of RGOS. But beyond that, there were not, not very substantial changes. So we started to realize that spatial data was not, not just the end of the road because we needed to deal with time as well. Uh, those of you who've used geographical information systems will be aware that time is something that they don't do very well. And we'd followed in the same uh, line of thought uh, with regard to, to, to handling time. What we had done, however, in the beginning of the, in the preface of the, of, of the first book, we'd included a, a figure. Uh, 
uh, which showed the dependency tree between this, this, this dependency tree. And in 2008, sort of, sort of in, in July 2008, June 2008, you could still print all of the names of the packages uh, which depended on SP. So we've got SP here, and then the, there are the packages which depended on SP, and the ones which are grey are the ones which the authors of the book maintained. So, so we mo maintained most of, of the ones which were there. Packages which, say, I also maintain, like, like Splunk's, doesn't, it, it's not an SP package, it uses its own, uh, own representation. So that some of the people had begun to, had begun to, uh, to adopt this. By the time we got to the 2013 book, so I'm not even sure if, if I can find the right, the right figure. Uh, we couldn't fit the the graph onto the page. So I, I have a, uh, a copy somewhere. Uh, in 2014, uh, Andres de Vries uh, did a, um, a cluster analysis of uh, using page ranks of packages on uh, CRAN. Uh, this is then a, a rerun from 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 uh, last month. This is, this is the fourth largest cluster on CRAN. It's, it's not a very big cluster. Um, I, I, I'm not exposing here how big it is. This, the, 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 if you scale the figures by the number of page ranks of the packages, then, then we're not big. But in a poster at, at the user meeting in Olborg, uh, in in uh, 2015, Microsoft or some, my, uh, someone who's now a Microsoft employee had, had discovered that Spatial was was the third, fourth, or fifth cluster in in terms of use of R. So at that stage, we realised that we'd we'd got ourselves into more trouble than we we expected. So we thought we were doing something which was to enable teaching. So that the first time I visited Edsa and, and gave a gave a talk uh, at Utrecht to his, when he was in still in, in Utrecht in 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 I think that must have been in two thousand four. Then the point of writing the software was to have it continued to be the same as it had been eight years earlier or six years earlier is writing software so that you can teach stuff. So that the idea was that you have a, a, a book on, on spatial data analysis and you can teach that with the software so that the students can not only uh, read about the theoretical definitions of the methods, but can try it out and can try it out on different data and can see what happens if, say, if you, if you, if you change the, the, the variogram, uh, the fit, if, you, if you're fitting a variogram by I, what happens if you, if you insert different, different values into the coefficients? So, so the, 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 we were still sort of thinking, well, people are going to use this for teaching, aren't they? And now we realize that this is, the, it, it's, it's much worse than that. So that if we, if we, um, and we did uh, break stuff, so we changed something in SP or changed something in one of the key packages like Argoodle or, or Argeos, then, then you get lots, lots of attention very quickly on, on the mailing lists that people, people get in touch and, and tell you things. So this is, this is the rationale for, uh, for where we go from here. So I'll, I'll carry on without a break because, because we're, we're online. Uh, so I think what we hadn't realized was that there was a considerable appetite for doing stuff with spatial data out there. 
This has also been influenced, but particularly in the last five to six years, by increasing access to data. If you look at the behavior of uh, national mapping agencies, five years ago, it was quite difficult to be able to download. You might be able to download a picture of a topographic map but you probably wouldn't be able to download any detailed data. The number of... I mean, you would, ten years ago, you would find a number of people who were exercising in the mountains over Bergen who had their own GPSs. But a GPS was, was this... So it's a fairly fairly clunky thing, and its batteries run out after about an hour. Uh, has anybody used one like that? So a GPS. So, so if you were going for a long hike, you took lots of batteries if you needed your GPS. Do you remember this? Is it, yeah. So the, this, this is not just me making it up. And that's, that's 10 years ago. So that it, at, a, at the doctoral course here, 2006, uh, there's a, a, a fisheries researcher who was working on lobsters, and he didn't yet have his lobster tracking data, so he was using a handhold GPS around the campus here to generate sample data for his project. So how he thought lobsters moved. It turned out later on that they didn't move like that, as he was using uh, acoustic uh, tracking, and he set out his triangulation points. Uh, but the lobsters had then a reflector uh, glued on, which he had to remove before they shed their carapaces, because otherwise they'd be killed. And they were moving around on the bottom of the sea. And the first, uh, after he'd stationed his, 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 his data collection points, the first things the lobsters do, did was move out of range. Because his, his imagination of where the lobsters, how, how far the lobsters would move on a given night, as he had no, he didn't have anything to base it on. There were no observations to give him a good idea of how, what, what the home range of a lobster was. But then you go to a course in 2008, 2010, 12, uh, and the amount of data that people have access to has exploded. It, it's become very, very large. So that where, whereas in 2006 people were using data sets, if you had 150 points, this, this was a big data set. And now, now under 150,000 is a bit small, really. So, so thing, things have happened quite, quite rapidly with regard to, to, to access to data. The way the data are configured is, is unchanging. Uh, spatial data is position data in 2 or 3D. And we've got attribute data and we've got metadata, which would be concerned, uh, connected to the position data. Uh, you could call spatial data map data or you could call it GIS data. The use of SP and similar has not. We're not. We're not clearly aware that it's been used on other planets. I mean, not that the people were on other planets, but it's been 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 used with regard to planetary data. But we do know that it's been used with regard to to microbiologic biological data. So that it's been used for very small things as well. Even though the there's just treating them as planar or three D. So that the, some of that has happened. Uh, I mentioned on on the on the, in, in the script that the the, the uh, GPS only became that's the GPS GPS the, the American military system only lost its uh, its uh, uh, civilian use noise uh, additive component uh, in two thousand as as. Um, uh, one of one of the last decisions of the Clinton presidency was was to remove the uh, remove the the noise component. So, where are we today? Uh, okay, so just just to give you a, a little bit, a couple of little, a few pictures to begin with. Um, um, we're in the SF package for vector data, not the SP package. I'll be pointing to the SP package where we get to it, and I'll be explaining where the SF package came to in a moment, came from in a moment. But this is also using the OSM 
data, OSM. Anybody OSM? OSM, so three letter acronyms. We, we won't get away from them. Even four, four letter acronyms we get through. Yeah. Uh, uh, OpenStreetMap. Does anybody use OpenStreetMap? Anybody consciously view OpenStreetMap data? Open a news, newspaper uh, website, the articles that they're running on, a, on online, if they have a map, they may have Google, but OpenStreetMap is free. They may be using an interface to OpenStreetMap, but sometimes if you look at this, the, the copyright line at the bottom, you see that this is, is, is OpenStreetMap data. Uh, OpenStreetMap started being used, it started being visible in terms of its usefulness in, uh, in a worldwide setting uh, after the Haitian earthquake. And the, uh, because there were, there were no extant digital maps so that, that volunteers in the field uh, were recording GPS data and uploading it. Uh, and so that, that suddenly from not having proper maps, then you had maps where you could identify where, where uh, different, uh, different uh, aid uh, was, was required. So OpenStreetMap is, is a, it, it's not 100% reliable and the, the code which you won't like to look at here uh, gives you an example of this is that one of the sources for the uh, uh, Bergen light rail system. Did any of you use the light rail on the way in from the airport? No? It, it, it's, it, it, it's much cheaper than the airport bus. Um, especially for people over, over 67 because then I get half price. So, so I've stopped using taxis to the airport so I can get there just as quickly with, with the light rail since 2017. But the first part was coded as, as a light rail, and the second part was coded as a tram, so that in downloading this data from... So what I've, what I've said here with regard to OpenStreetMap is that this is the, the query that I'm going to generate, uh, and I want to generate for a, a, a bounding box just for Bergen, Norway. So I'm saying this is in Bergen, Norway. I don't want light rail from everywhere. And what I want to do is to query uh, the uh, railway features with a value of light rail and extract the lines as SF, simple features lines, and put them in this one. Then I'm going to get the trams. Then I have to uh, remove some of the tram entries which are bogus. Then I have to find out, because the two, two different data sets have different sets of headers, so they have different columns with data in, so I take an intersection of them so that I can then uh, uh, put them together as, as two different, as a merge the two different uh, data sets together. And here I'm saving them as, a, as an RDS uh, object. Uh, so here I'm defining the area of interest. Here I had to do a little exploration. So try, try and find out which values worked. So you have to look at the table and see which values are present and then guess that they may be the right ones. Uh, a little bit further out, looked at, found that there was some were light rail, some were tram. Some of the trams are actually the museum tram in the center of town, which doesn't run. So these are the ones here which are being removed because some enthusiast had been around and made an extremely detailed map of the museum tram tracks in the center of town, which don't run. And here we have it. So spatial vector data is points. So we've got points that make lines, and then we can construct larger, l l uh, more complex uh, uh, objects from, from these. The light rail tracks are, are 2D vector data. The points are stored, stored as double precision floating point, uh, and they're downloaded uh, from from the open street maps from, from, from the cloud. And this is then uh, where we are. But wh wh what else are we doing here? Uh, what else has happened to the way that we handle spatial data in R? Uh, both the TMAP package and map view uh, provide interactive mapping. They provide it through Leaflet, which is uh, uh, another package, 
which uses leaflet.js, which is a JavaScript library, so that they're, they're a layer on layer, one above another. Uh, but this means then that we can, instead of choosing this, we could choose this background, or we could choose an open street map background, which takes a little longer to, to load. And we can, of course, zoom and pan and, and so on. So that we can we can visit ourselves here. So this is this is a standard uh, uh, standard interface of the kind that you're used to from 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 web maps. Uh, the map view package began in. Uh, probably in 2014, uh, Tim Applehans. Uh, I, the, 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 there's, a, there's a series of seminars now called the, the Open GeoHub Seminars. The 2014 one was held in, in these two rooms here, as this C and B, and was also streamed. And at that stage, we hadn't really realized that this was going to happen. And I noticed that the package was made available on CRAN and emailed Tim and said, well, we're going to have the next uh, uh, Open GeoHub seminar in Lancaster in, in uh, August 2015. Could you drop by? So uh, he dropped by and uh, he, he's, he's a, a good community player and, and, and contributes a lot. And there are, there are it's really um, um, it, it, uh, satisfying, perhaps is the, is the is the right word to to, to see a, a generation of people who are 30, 35 years younger uh, than I am, as like uh, uh, Jakub Novosad, uh, like uh, Robin Lovelace, like like Tim. Uh, and, and lots of others, and uh, the, the, uh, Martin Tenek is the, the author of TMAP. So there are lots of other people contributing things, but they all build on an infrastructure which, which we have to, 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 to maintain. So, so map view is, is, is important, and it's also based on what we didn't have until very recently, which was access to the tiles uh, to place behind the uh, behind the, the, the interactive web max. Uh, we can also uh, take another example. It's, an, it's based on a package by, uh, by Robin Lovelace, the uh, ST Plan R. So it, this is, uh, trans, is for transport planning. And what's going on here, and if you want to replicate it, it's, 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 uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's okay to do that. Uh, but I have blanked out here my uh, individual API key to um, to a conversion from desire lines from and to for transport uh, data to um, uh, to routing on a particular route. And this isn't done properly. This is just just a picture. But again, what we're doing here is downloading the complete uh, set of monthly. Uh, comma separated value files from the city bike system in Bergen. Uh, they've been downloaded and placed in, in a uh, folder called BBS. Uh, you can download the same ones if you like. I, I don't think I made them available. I, I can't recall whether I made them available. Uh, so then, then we need to read in the, uh, read in the, um, the trips. We then need to massage the trips. Uh, some of them are so that quite a lot of the 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 the, the initial is finding out uh, um, which stations. So it's from and to stations. So obviously the the city bikes are taken from and handed in to the same hubs. And then some of them are moved, which we don't know. We, the, the data on movements of bikes, where they accumulate at one city centre hub and need to be moved back to a place with no bikes. So we don't have that data. 
but we know where the stations are. Uh, and we also know that uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the um, one of the stations was actually in Oslo because that was where the bikes were primed, so that you get spurious movements across the whole of, uh, of southern Norway, uh, where they're not actually cycling, but they're 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 they're, they're, they're just being moved. Actually, I don't, I'm fairly certain that these are the actual cycled trips and not the trips made when, when they're moved by the, uh, by the uh, trucks. Okay, so that then we have, have counts of, so what we're doing here is summing the, the counts between each potential pair of, pair of stations. So you've got the origin station and the destination station, so this is the OD object. And the OD object is simply a table of uh, counts from and to for each pair of pair, pair of stations for which they exist, subtracting the ones where the bike was taken from and returned to the same station, because obviously then there's no desire line. So using uh, ST plan R, we want to create the OD lines given the stations where we know the uh, geographical coordinates of the stations. And we know the flows. That's the number of uh, the the number of, of uh, flows from which station to which station. So that, that here we've got a table of about a hundred something stations, uh, and here we've got the not a hundred by hundred. So we haven't got ten thousand uh, desire lines because some of them would have been zero and they drop out, and some of them are from and to the same one. So it's down the down the principal diagonal, so that they're out. So we have the, 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 the lines, that's this, this one, which we could then again zoom into. And here the, uh, an alpha channel is used to indicate, uh, alpha channel and the width of the lines are used to indicate which. And the, the closest hub here is, is actually uh, a bit closer to to the city than here. So you've got to walk about 15 minutes to get the first hub, 15 minutes, 20, 50, 15, yeah, something like that. Uh, however, the package also, uh, the, the, the uh, ST plan R package also provides a function called uh, line to route. Uh, which if you have signed up to get an API key from Cycle Street, which is a UK uh, website, which is, uh, you'd usually use it as, I have a bike, I'm standing here, I want to get to there, give me a route. But here we're giving them a subset of 10,000 <laughs> routes, uh, and uh, that takes a little longer. So, it, so this was then pre-generated, and, and uh, uh, you also need to apply in advance to get the to get the API key. But once you've got the API key, you can you can you can go. If you're using it sort of just once uh, from a, 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 an application or something like that, then then you'll be using the API key of the uh, owner of the application or developer of the application. So that here we get to something like that. So that if we allocate all of these, uh, all of these uh, cycle trips, assuming that the hub that the bikes were handed back to was logical. This, on a sunny day in Bergen, there are sunny days in the summer, or even in the spring, then then people will say, "I just want to cycle. I ju just just want to cycle around." So that they, they, they there isn't a, a real desire line. They're just cycling from somewhere, to, round in circles, and leave it somewhere else. And it, it, it that's that if you like, that's okay. Most of that is 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 fairly central in 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 town. You do begin now to see a certain density out around here. There are certain things going on here, but again, partly assuming that that we've picked up the the effective movements, but we are starting to get a, a density of of cycle movements. 
So those are the kinds of things which are going on. So the 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 the, the um, Uh, these are the the um, the files. As I actually only went through to halfway through November, I could have gone a bit further, and I didn't get October, which I should have got. Okay, so that we're then at uh, each of the CVS files is at thirty uh, mega. These are these are data sizes which uh, they're they're just not real compared to where we were twenty years ago. <laughs> As you, you you had thirty mega on your hard disk though, <laughs> it was was R wouldn't run. Uh, R needed uh, uh, a, a two mega object in R in uh, in nineteen ninety seven was too much. Uh, and even though you could do some quite hairy regressions and things and and lots of modelling, but the data sizes were much smaller than the, the ones with which we're familiar now and where. Uh, data has been made available openly, so there's much. There's the access to data is much greater, but it, it's fairly heterogeneous. You've seen in both of the examples that I've given you, is that if you were looking at R for the first time, maybe some of you are, then you say, "This looks scary." Because what I'm having to do is a lot of data cleaning to get something which is even representable on a map, because of the the, the data is provided by the data providers in ways which they feel is appropriate and which for their purposes almost certainly is appropriate. They may not have thought about it a great deal and they just dump it out. But they may need it internally and those are the variables they need internally. Okay, good. But that leaves us with problems of advancing from the SP representation. So if we take take the the object that we had here, we have the 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 the, uh, the light rail system. Oh, I can check every every little bit. No, we're still no fur no further comments coming in. We're in slight something of a of of a time loop. Uh, 17 years ago, it made a great deal of sense to use the formal class system for representing spatial data. Many other um, uh, implementation projects at the time used the same representation. Bioconductor in particular, which is a, an, an off CRAN archive network with curated packages. It's a very solid uh, bioinformatics um, uh, resource. It uh, also chooses to use, uh, by and large, uh, S4 classes. They are formal classes, you define them ahead of time. And we can get from the SF representation, which I'll talk about in, in, in a moment, to, uh, to SP by coercion. So here we're coercing from the, the object here to an SP object. And then we can look at the, the formal representation, which we can see here. Here we have uh, an object with four slots. It has a data slot, a line slot, which contains the, 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 the geometries, a bounding box slot, and a proj4 string slot, which contains the, the coordinate reference system, which is also a formal class. And then we can look at the way in which the geometries are represented. And if we just start at the first, the first one of these lines, so we're taking the first slot of we're taking the line slot, and then we're looking at the first element of that list, and we can see that this is a formal, this is a formal class of lines, formal class of line, and within the line we've then got a matrix of coordinates. We've got a matrix of coordinates inside, but we know ahead of time that the coordinates are are, uh, are floating point numbers, because if you are moving between R and C code and you had integers as coordinates, then you would get a mess, or you have to check. But in a formal class system, you don't have to check because the class would be invalid if somebody, somebody if they tried to insert an integer as a coordinate, they'd say it would be converted to floating point straight away. They wouldn't be allowed to do it. 
so that we would know ahead of time a lot about the way that the data was, 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 was structured. So that was the idea of having, having a, a formal representation, was that we saved time in interfacing, uh, interfacing compiled languages uh, outside. Spatial raster data, in contrast from vector data, which is observed at points, and from the points you construct lines. If you need to construct polygons, you construct those from the lines, you know, which lines in which directions make up a, 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 a ring to construct a, to construct a polygon. But well, if we want some raster data, and so far we haven't got any, We could, for example, use the, uh, the uh, elevator package. Again, when we were working with SP, and even when we were at the level of the second edition of the books, that's 2012-13, if you wanted satellite elevation data, you had to download it. You had to download tiles of elevation data. You had to identify where you were going to get them from. Many of them were available sometimes with a login. So if you went to USGS, uh, you might have a login, and then they would send you an email when the, uh, when the t files you had requested had been packaged and could be downloaded, were av available for download. So this would be the, the typical system. This, you'd go possibly to a web interface. You would choose the files that you wanted, you would request them, and generally you'd need a login or some kind of email interactions that you would give your email address. Uh, you'd be sent a challenge to reply whether you're a, a bot or a person, and you'd reply, I'm a person, and, uh, and then you'd be sent a, a link from which you could download the data. But this is now on, on uh, AWS. This is full elevation data at different levels of, of uh, resolution. And it's, it, it's there. We don't, in the elevator package, they do document uh, the provenance of the data, so when it was observed and what the quality of the data is. This is something one needs to keep an eye on when working with online data sources. But in this case, uh, if, you, if you ask for this, in this case, we're using the spatial uh, the coerced spatial SP version of uh, the uh, light rail tracks. So you get a bounding box around the light rail tracks, and that gets pushed out to the server. It says, okay, this is, this is the, the, uh, the uh, area you want. This is the zoom level that you want. And off we go. And it will then go to the cloud and say, okay, this is, this is what we need, and this is what we pull in. And uh, when, this is, when this is read in, this is read in as a raster layer from the raster package. The raster package builds on the raster representation in uh, SP and also uses formal classes. Uh, the raster package was written at the end of the 20 zeros. This is 2008, 2009, 2010. And... Uh, also uses the S4 classes, the same as in SP. We did write in the second edition of our book that we really hope that the raster book comes out soon. It still hasn't come out. It, it would be really useful. Uh, but Robert Hemans, who wrote the raster package, is very busy, has done an awful lot of work in modernizing the package. And you have, to have, you have to be able to do the other things you do. And he works on, on um, um, uh, crop robustness. And so he's worked in the Philippines. He work, he's worked on potatoes. He's worked on rice and things like that. So that he's, he's a working uh, field, um, uh, f field ecologist. And uh, so writing a book in addition is, is, is something that just hasn't happened yet. But this is a, a formal class. We can, we can uh, look at its representation as a spatial grid data frame, so that there's the spatial 
representation of the data frame. And once again, you see that there's a data, but there aren't lines as there were with the light rail. But there's a grid, which is defining the geometry. In this case, the grid is quite simple because it's just saying uh, what is the uh, southwest grid center point, coordinates of the southwest grid center point, how many grid cells are there in each direction, and what is their step, what's their size. So you've got the data with the data frame with, with the observations of the elevation, uh, and the grid defining the geometry, the bounding box, and the project force stream. Uh, we can, whoops, 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 whoops. We come back to this on Tuesday. So I've got your attention. Uh, grids not updated for proj greater than or equal to six. And we can display, um, we can display the, uh, the 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 object here. I probably should actually have have changed the the representation of um, the should have changed the representation of the um, from uh, from. Uh, Here I was using topo colors, and I probably should have used terrain colors, so that you're getting blue where it isn't blue. It's, it, it should be uh, green, so darker green. But, but you can see that, that uh, once again, we've, we, we've, got, we've, we've got the data. Uh, and the, the initial warnings before we get to, got to the warnings about PROJ, which there were lots of, um, Uh, what MapView was saying was that it's quite difficult for me to represent as much data as this. Could you, uh, if if you really want to show all of the pixels, then sh then g tell me to do that. But otherwise, I will uh, decimate the pixels, the number of pixels which are being being displayed. Uh, one of the the consequences of these uh, proj warnings, uh, we'll we'll be looking at them tomorrow morning, is that the uh, is that the data might perhaps have been offset. In relation to where they should be in register, on the on the uh, the web map. Yes. Do you use the squares or rectangles to raster the data here, or is it possible using hexagons as well? Uh, yes, with qualifications, so that there there is a, a DG grid uh, package which provides not only for hexagons, but a mixture of hexagons and pentagons to give a complete global coverage. Uh, however, uh, the current status with regard to whether you can treat those as a vector object or a raster object is unclear for, for obvious reasons. Uh, a, a raster objects are most often, or raster arrays in, in depth because they may have four dimensions, that's the x, x and y dimensions, the time dimension, and the attributes dimensions that you could be measuring or using different instruments on a, on a, an, on a satellite. The, we're, not, we're not there, but the, the DG grid is, is, uh, is, uh, is, is somewhere, somewhere to look. Uh, could you get back to that after we turn off the screen, streaming at 11 o'clock and then I can change my screen and, and look for the package or you can look for the package yourself. But there are, there are a number of possibilities like that. Okay, so the raster package has been widely adopted and is a, a fairly robust way of represent, representing, uh, representing data. Um, one of the other things, but it, it, it's also based that, that what, what, what Rasta does in particular is to say that, okay, uh, the, the Google library and our Google has a, uh, uh, an opportunity, op offers the opportunity for uh, reading not the whole Rasta, 
but for reading chunks of a raster. So you can decide which columns and rows of a raster you want to read, and you don't have to read the whole raster at the same time. So that one of the things that, that raster permitted was to iterate across a large raster to generate results from a large raster, which in 2008 you couldn't get into your memory because your memory was much smaller. So then you were looking at a Uh, 32-bit systems, then probably you weren't really handling memory above 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 a couple of gigabytes. So the, this this has 16, uh, but but 16 is something I've only had recently. Uh, four gigabytes was much more typical. Two gigabytes, one gigabyte of memory, and the being able to handle a big raster. 10 years ago was, was really hard. So that, that, that facility in, in Raster was important and it used uh, Argoodl to do that. One of the things which has been absolutely crucial has been help from the CRAN administrators, in particular, uh, Professor Brian Ripley of the University of Oxford, who from very early on uh, first uh, compiled all of the external dependencies for Windows and for OS X himself on his own machine and made them available so that if you were going to use our Google, then he would, so before the Windows binary version was available on CRAM, then he was providing them from his own server in, in, um, in Oxford. And this was extremely useful, well, in the sense of growing the user base, it was, it was absolutely killing because it meant that lots and lots of students were using this stuff because they could install it and they were installing it from Oxford rather than from CRAN, which didn't at the, hadn't then developed the capacity to, 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 to do this. And his sympathetic support continues to be, to, to be very important so that uh, it is the rule rather than the exception that if something is going to go wrong, then Brian Ripley will find it before we do. Um, this, this, this is, this is, it's not, not just for our spatial, he covers everybody's backs. Uh, like finding out that, that uh, Fedora 30, the Fortran in Fedora 30 was more strict about standards than any previous version and led to things falling apart for, for everybody. And so, but, but, but that, that, that's, Maybe a minority interest, but but when you use R, you can be sure that the fact that it's running properly is is to quite a large extent uh, down to to Brian Ripley from things like memory management on Windows, which he's written himself, or parts of which he's modified himself. Um, going going back an awful long way. Obviously, then there was a limited set of vector and raster drivers, so that some of them were not available, and others have been made available as time goes on. So that when we were contacted by uh, by the Sentinel team at uh, at uh, um, the Joint Research Centre, the U European Union uh, Research uh, Institution, to add the JPEG 2000 uh, driver to the Windows and OS X. So that we found out how to do that using Open JPEG 2000, um, so that that we we have, if you like, full Sentinel support because there was interaction between the data providers and the people on CRAN who could help us with the libraries we needed to to, to permit Google to to handle handle these kinds of things. Okay, so questions are arising. Uh, I've already mentioned the RGOS package. The RGOS package was was fairly consistent in its use of of uh, simple features. And the idea with simple features was that you defined a hierarchy of classes theoretically, and it was then a good idea if software implemented that hierarchy of classes and not some other hierarchy of classes. The hierarchy of classes which we implemented for vector data in well, the way in which we implemented the hierarchy of classes for vector data in SP was more based on the then most used vector format, which was a shapefile. And the shapefile does not distinguish adequately between an internal ring 
and an external ring so that a polygon will have an, sorry, an exterior ring. So it will have an exterior ring and if there's a hole in the polygon that's its in interior ring. Now the difference between the exterior ring and the interior ring in a shapefile is that they they go in different directions. The coordinates go clockwise or anticlockwise to define whether they are exterior or interior. However, in the simple features, each polygon can only have one exterior ring. In a shapefile, you can have an object which calls itself a polygon, which has got multiple exterior rings, like a collection of islands. But in S, the simple features, SF, then you have to call this a multi-polygon. You can't call it a polygon. And our system was inconsistent in this way, is that we could have messes of this. The first one was drawn to my attention by my brother in 2004 when he was trying to plot uh, uh, labour market data for Sheffield and found that some uh, enumeration districts were disappearing. And it turned out that we were plotting the enumeration districts in order, so by number. So if it's A, B, C, D, then we plot them that way. And it turned out that to get round that, you needed to plot the biggest one first and successively smaller ones which might over, be overplotted by the big one afterwards. So, th so that there was a lot of mess caused by not using simple features. If we'd use simple features from the beginning, which we couldn't because they hadn't been defined or hadn't been standardized, then everything would have been a lot simpler, but that simply wasn't available. So we need vector standards compliance. Uh, JTS and GEOS, so JTS is the Java or original version of, of GEOS. Uh, they require simple feature compliance mechanism. And to do this, then we had to uh, create a kludge for SP polygons objects to define which of the component rings were exterior and interior rings and if they were interior rings to which of the exterior rings did they belong. So it was a mess. Uh, Spatio-temporal data also appeared as uh, so a um, it, I mean, it should es essentially be obvious that all spatial data is spatiotemporal anyway. Maybe you just have one observation for each point, but 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 each point is observed at a sp particular point in time. We get back to this tomorrow morning uh, with the uh, with the um, uh, with the. Um, Uh, examination of coordinate reference systems. Uh, indeed, now geodet geodeticists would like each observed point to be given a timestamp. So when was this point observed? Uh, and as one of the uh, geodeticists who really enjoys working on uh, Iceland, he says, you go back a week later and it's moved. Because there are earthquakes, there are tectonic movements, so that the landscape is 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 dancing. And he says this is for a geodeticist, this is really fun, so that if you're observing a GPS point, we need that timestamp as well. It's not good enough just to have the 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 position. And GPS uh, observations come with a timestamp because time is what drives GPS. So so we'd realized that the, 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 the setting was, was, were, was inadequate. The, the original publication of the ISO, which at that stage was closed, was, there wasn't access to it, was in 2004, and work on international standards proceeded from then on. So that there's a paper by, uh, an article by uh, Kralidis uh, and a, a longer work by Herring about this. So that we needed to go back to, 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 to simple features. Uh, in terms of my presentation, I'm now somewhat behind my schedule so that uh, when, when I break at 11 o'clock, I break at 11 o'clock. 
and we'll carry on with what I haven't completed from the first section uh, at 1.15, um, because these, these foundations are, 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 I think, quite, quite important. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with uh, data frames? So in, 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 in terms of R, from Python, data tables? Okay, yeah. So I'll, I'll give you some basic background on data frame objects in, in R. Assume that we, was, uh, I'll, I'll complete this, this little bit um, first. Simple features in R, which is where we're going to get to. Um, sort of began uh, after uh, Edser and uh, Paolo Ribeiro and I were, were through with a special issue of the Journal of Statistical Software in 2015. So that we finished the book, then there was a the special issue, and then we took a, a shallow breath and said, what's going to hit us next? And, yeah, we need to revisit the vectors. So we'll look at doing simple features. Uh, support was offered from 2016 by the newly started uh, our consortium. And the key breakthrough was uh, after um, Had Hadley Wickham, uh, who's, the, uh, who, who's, a, who's a programmer working, or statistician working at our studio, and previously uh, working on ggplot, and ggplot2 uh, had declared that data needed to be tidy and data frames were tidy. He'd also said that list columns are not tidy. However, at the 2016 USAR conference at Stanford, Edster and I were sitting at the side of the room coding as we usually did, and suddenly we, we, we sort of uh, started listening to the plenary. And Hadley had just declared that list columns were tidy. So he said, OK. He then explained why. And he said, well, we've been trying in ggplot to draw maps. And we've had problems with exactly this. So how do you create a tidy data frame where two of the variables are the x and y coordinates of the lines you want to draw, or the containers for fill colors. And the way that they'd done it previously was simply by uh, having a list of oh, sorry, uh, vectors of the x coordinates, vectors of the y coordinates, where the pen was supposed to move from x, x1, y1 to x2, y2 to x. And then it would get to a line where there were so you jump over to the next lot, which is the way it had been done in S plus as well. But they were losing holes from the middle of the polygons when they were filling, so there was no way to, to sort this out. And he'd, he'd come around to our point of view, which was that you needed to have a richer data structure to handle uh, geometries of this kind. So list columns are tidy. So what is a data frame object? A data frame object in, in R and elsewhere, or is the, the same kind of structure in Python, uh, is a list object. What's a list object? A list object is one of the things behind much as of the success of modern programming language, or, or even what would probably now be called standard programming languages, which is that uh, if you go back to when I started programming, which was Fortran and Algol, uh, then there weren't structures like this. But when you got to C, there were lots of structures like this. That's a list which you can grow and where one element may point to the next element. So you've got something which is not structured as a, as a vector. Well, actually, a list is a vector. In a regular vector, all of the the elements of the vector have to have the same, this need to be of the same kind. But in a list, you can put whatever in. You can put a list component, can be another list. Or it could be an integer, or it could be a character string, or it could be a floating point number. Uh, so lists are very flexible tools. 
uh, if you look at the output of uh, fitting a regression in R, what is it? Of course, it's a list. It has a class LM, but it's a list. So lists are prevalent. There are lots of them. Vectors are fairly simple, uh, and I can give some references if 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 people people need references for for that. Uh, lists can be manipulated with single square brackets, and you can get out the what's inside with a double square brackets. So here we'll start with vectors of four different types: uh, v1, which is integers one through three; uh, v2, which are the letters one through three. It says a, b, c. Uh, V3 is the square root of V1, which is going to be a floating point number. And V4 is a complex of the negative of that, which gives us a complex vector. And we can make these into, into a list. So we've made these into a list. And if we look at the structure, the str is a function for showing the structure, uh, we, can, we can get the, we can, get the um, we, we can see what's inside. So V1 is, is uh, 1, 2, 3. V2 is ABC, V3 is 1, 1 1.4, 1.7. And we can then see the same in the, the complex number. We can access them either using double square brackets or using a dollar and the name of the, of the list element. Okay, so we can, we can, we can we're, we're handling this, this list. But the list is uh, the template for creating a vector, and what's why is a a, a data frame different from a, any list? The only serious difference is that the uh, list components have to be of the same length. The data frame is thought of as being a, reg, a rectangular container for data, but it is a list. We can create this by using as data frame, so it's coercing to data frame. And here we see that the, 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 um, the classes of the objects remain, uh, I can't quite get both of them on at the same time. So you see here we've got integer character numeric uh, uh, complex. And what we've got here is integer factor numeric complex. Uh, Strings as factors is the default in R and has been since S uh, because statisticians needed to treat uh, categorical variables as statistically important variables which should be handled properly uh, and not simply as just text. And now treating just text as categorical variables is something which goes back to the beginning of S and has been inherited, so that by default, if you give uh, either read in or convert another object to a data frame, then it will say, "Okay, you want uh, you want to uh, you want me to handle this this uh, um, string character string data, so I'm going to convert it to a factor. A factor is something like a hash table, which makes it easy to to build dummy variables, for instance, in a model." It's possible to, to set this argument strings as factors to false and not take the default, in which case we get the, the representation we had before, but we now have a data frame rather than a list. And the data frame can also be handled in, 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 in other ways. We could also uh, extend uh, two of these and try to create a... So as a list, this is quite fine with with uh, with uh, components of different lengths, but when we try to convert this to a data data frame, then there's an error, and the error is uh, arguments imply different differing numbers of rows, so that it it will stop us doing this. So we know that the difference between a whatever list and the data frame is that. A data frame is a list with components with, uh, with, uh, with the same length, of, or components of the same length. We can also access the elements which, which are there in the same way that we could do with a list. But we can also access them as though we were looking at the data frame as a matrix, but it's not a matrix, because it's a list. So this is, the data frame is a rectangular object, 
we can access things treating them as though they were uh, elements uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a matrix. There's a further point here, uh, which is concerned with the drop equals false or drop equals true. Drop equals true by default since early S, so for a very, very long time. That is, if you subselect a matrix or a data frame or a, a two or more dimensional array down to one, down to two dimensions, so that if you have a three dimensional array and subset, so that you're taking, taking uh, just one slice, then it goes down to two dimensions. If you take just one vector, it goes down to one dimension. So that's drop equals true, which is default. So that if we, if we ask what is then a, this, this uh, subset, we're just looking at one element. So it's saying the understanding would be that we just want that single element. So drop is true by default. If we set drop is false, we get a data frame with one row and one column. We could uh, try to coerce the data frame to a matrix, but in this case we have a character variable, a factor or character variable in, in, in the data frame. So it will coerce all of the values to, to, uh, to, um, to character. So this is then a character matrix. If we just take the, the, uh, the two columns of the data frame which are numeric, the integer and numeric, there's a third one which was the complex, leaving that out, uh, we get uh, we get a, uh, a numeric matrix. Obviously, the length of list L was four. We put four things into it, so its length is four. So, what's the length of the data frame that we created from L? It's four because it's a list of four components, the the columns. What's the link length of the data frame when we've turned it into a matrix? It's 12 because it's three times four. So we've got four columns, three rows. Why should a matrix have a length? And it's a vector, yes. Yeah. We, uh, so the, the, the answer for the uh, for those who, who who don't enjoy this this level of abstraction, <laughs> is, is that uh, a, a matrix is a vector with a dim attribute of length two. An array is a vector with a dim attribute of two or more. So this this goes back to to S. <laughs> so it it goes back a long way. Uh, and part of the reason is that the data are organized so that moving the object from uh, the S side to the C side, uh, C uses uh, um, what's known as column major representation of matrices, and the representation here is also column major. Fortran uses row major. That, that's even more abstract. So that when you when you ask what's the length of something, you need to think. Uh, well, but what am I asking? Or what what's the underlying representation of, of the data here? And if the underlying representation is a list, it will be the 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 uh, the, the length of the list. So if we ask what's the dim of a list, it says no, I don't have that attribute. If we ask what the dim of the data frame is, it does, but it doesn't need to. But it has. So it sort of pretends to have a dim attribute, but a matrix has to have a dim attribute, otherwise it's a vector. So that if we look at the, uh, at, uh, the, the, this, the coercion of the data frame to a matrix, then we see that it's a character matrix of three rows and four columns, and it has a dim names attribute. We're not, it, we're not, we're not showing the, the, the dim attribute here. Uh, the row names of the data frame, 
this has also been modified as time has go, gone on. Originally, all data frames had fully enumerated uh, row names, which if you had one to a thousand, it didn't really matter. They took up a bit of space, but not very much. But if you've got one to a hundred million, it takes up a bit of space and perhaps it's irrelevant. So that uh, about 10 years ago, R said that if the row names are just the integers from one to N, then we store a marker saying that to uh, generate them on the fly if you need them. Uh, you, can, uh, you can change the, the names of a data frame. You can uh, adapt them. Uh, we can look, say, here at the attributes of the data frame. We've now changed the names to ABC, big A, B, big B, B, big C. It has a class and it has row names of one, more, one, two, three. If we look at the matrix, then we see that it has a list of two, uh, a list of two attributes. The reason why they're not uh, this was sorry. This was just uh, showing the uh, what, what's happening here is that str is seeing that this is a matrix, so I encode the information in the dim attribute in this description here, and then only displaying the other attribute which is present. But if we ask attributes of, of this object, then we can see both of the attributes, the dim attribute and the dim names attribute. Uh, one of the possibilities is to, is to uh, address um, different length vectors by inserting missing values, and missing values are, are not available. Now, because it's important, uh, I'll mention tidy lists now, and then we'll be fresh to start SF at quarter past one. So what is a, a list column? So here, what we're doing is we're adding an extra component to our data frame, so adding an extra column to the data frame, which is a list. And this list contains one uh, floating point number, one character, and one logical value. And if we then look at the structure of our data frame, we've got the data frame we had before. OK, good. Things are there. And we've got a list. Now, putting this into a regression and saying, OK, so that we want to regress A on E is going to lead to mayhem. So don't do it. <laughs> but list columns are valid. They've been valid since forever. It's not immediately obvious how, say, to write them out to a comma-separated value file spreadsheet. In some settings it should be okay, in others it might not, but how do you know what formatting constraints to put on column E? You don't really. So, so that there are things with list columns which are iffy, but list columns are completely legal. And that's where we go when we go to, 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 to SF. As I said, at uh, the user meeting in a plenary, Hadley-Wickham said that list columns are tidy. So from there on, okay, off we go. Uh, I'll stop the streaming uh, now. <laughs>